I feel like everyone needs to know this. I feel like everyone needs to see that it can be different, that we can think and feel and choose and live and love different. Hello, my loves. Welcome back to the Lavender Lifestyle Podcast. It's Eileen. Today's episode is on how to master your mind and tap into the true power of your mind to design your thoughts and thus your life. We cover topics like self-esteem, radical self-love, mental strength, and more in today's episode. Our guest today is Julia Christina. Julia Christina is a speaker, teacher, master therapist, and mental wealth coach who helps smart, highly sensitive, heart-centered humans get past anxiety, stress, and self-doubt so that they can have better, better relationships, a better life, and feel better about themselves. Through her membership program, The Shift Society, she helps people identify their deep-rooted thoughts and beliefs that are keeping them stuck and struggling, and then teaches them how to take charge of their minds and emotions so they can thrive in all areas of their lives. Julia's expertise has been featured in Inc. Magazine, Psych Central, Mind Body Green, and numerous other publications, podcasts, and television outlets. Hello, Julia. Welcome to the podcast. How are you, you doing so today? Yes, I am doing good now that we are here. <laughs> <laughs> we had a challenge making this work, but we are here. We made it happen. Um, okay, so Julia, why don't we start out by sharing what realm of therapy are you the most passionate about helping people in? Like, are there specific topics or areas that really just excite you? Teaching people how to use their own brains to really just change their lives. And so really understanding that we have so much more wisdom and knowledge and resilience and understanding within ourselves, within our own human brains, that we're often you know, out there looking for all these answers on the outside instead of taking some time to you know, get a few bits of understanding and then really being able to access so much more of our minds than we often realize that we can. Mm, that sounds really exciting because I'm. I, I think people don't realize the power of our brains and what we Absolutely. can do to change our lives. All right, before we get into all of that, how is this informed or inspired by your own journey? I want to hear about your journey. Ha, yeah, I guess you would call have called me in denial for a very long time when I first was really interested in pursuing a graduate degree in counseling psychology, I thought I was just going to be going to help other people because I was always that person that people would come to and share their problems with and, you know, talk to about stuff. And I just felt like this, yeah, I feel like I could do this for a job and I really love it and I get a lot out of it. And, but then, you know, starting grad school, a big process in there is going through our own process of uncovering things, of understanding ourselves more. And through, you know, this process of being in grad school and unpacking my own stuff, realized that there was a lot more stuff there than I had known. And it just started to answer some questions for me that I thought, was really powerful to be like, you know, I knew that I struggled with things, but I didn't really know how to identify them. I didn't really know what was going on. I was always someone that had a lot of really big feelings and felt just almost suffocated by my feelings a lot of the time because I didn't know what to do with them. But I thought that was just the way that I was and there was nothing I could do about it. And then, you know, fast forward how many years later when I was in grad school and started to really uncover a lot of patterns and programming and things that I had been through in my own childhood and through my own experiences and seeing how those were impacting me and then realizing that these things that were a certain way inside of me could be changed and I could feel better and I could feel more comfortable and confident in my own skin and more calm and grounded and just like thrive as a human being. But I didn't know what thriving was because I was in such a state of struggle. Wow. And so from there, I was like, oh, if this stuff is this powerful, 
I feel like everyone needs to know this. I feel like everyone needs to see that it can be different, that we can think and feel and choose and live and love different. That's beautiful. I, I also love the way you express that. What were some of the things that you can bring up that you healed from specifically? Like in your journey, what were your struggles and, and how did you heal? Or like, what, what were the things you healed? Yeah, really understanding that there was a lot of codependence in my family. And I didn't understand this. I thought I always just had a close family instead of, you know, I think my first introduction to personal development was understanding or just starting to learn about the concept of boundaries. So this was even before I started grad school, before I was becoming a counselor. I don't know how this book came across my life, but it was the book, The Dance of Anger by Harriet Lerner. So this is a classic. This is an excellent book for, I would say, especially women who feel often um, overshadowed or stifled in who they are. So feel overshadowed by their mothers, their sisters, you know, anyone else, like even, you know, uh, their boss, their, their fathers, their partners, like whoever that is, women who just feel kind of like stifled or overshadowed or like other people have more authority over their own lives, their own choices, their own wants, needs, and preferences than they do. Mm. And so just kind of feeling stuck in their own sense of self. And so I remember reading this book for the first time and for the first time in my life, really seeing that I was allowed to have my own thoughts, ideas, preferences, wants, and needs that my mom, my dad, my sister, my brother didn't have to understand or agree with. And for me, that was mind blowing. And then I had to ask myself the question, why is this so mind blowing? And then really seeing that like, oh, okay, there's some patterns that I grew up with, some, you know, uh, family of origin styles that have had a bigger impact on me than I realized. And I remember, you know, the first time I set like a very intentional, clear boundary in my family and it feeling so very uncomfortable because it was almost like there was uns this unspoken rule that this is how we do things. This is your role in the family. This is what you have to do and you cannot not fulfill this expectation. And I was, you know, adult years old <laughs> when I was like, but maybe I don't have to. And it had never occurred to me that I maybe did not have to do or be or show up as or act like or go along with what other people expected of me. Mm -hmm. And that felt like it, at the time, it felt revolutionary. Yeah. And then I had to ask myself, why does this feel so revolutionary? And then really understanding because of these patterns of enmeshment, of a lot of codependence, of a lot of, you know, stuffing and stifling my own being, because that was how the family norm existed. And I could go into, you know, all kinds of different things and dynamics that were going on in my family. And again, this isn't about blaming my parents. Parents are just people, right? So I had to understand a lot of this stuff, not to be like, oh, my parents did this to me, but to be like, my parents were humans. And, you know, we're just older people trying to figure out how to do life. And they didn't always do things the best way for me, for their other children. But this isn't about blame because no human is perfect. And I think that most people are kind of trying to do the best they, ca they can with what they've got. And some people don't necessarily have a lot. All right, time for a short break. Support for today's episode comes from Honey Love. Whether you are a bride, wedding guest, or simply seeking everyday smoothing, Honey Love is the go-to for all things shapewear. 
Honey Love has revolutionized compression technology so you no longer have to feel like you're suffocating while wearing effective shapewear. Honey Love's lingerie-inspired designs make you feel cute while using breathable fabric that keeps you nice and cool. Plus, you don't have to worry about it rolling down thanks to the flexible boning hidden in the side seams. I have the crossover bra and superpower brief. The bra is the most comfortable yet supportive wire-free bra I've tried and is also really flattering. Their superpower series are designed to sculpt and smooth without squeezing your natural curves. Trust that you'll get a boost of confidence wearing these. Treat yourself to the best bras and shapewear on the market and save 20% off at honeylove.com slash TLL. Use our exclusive link to get 20% off. It's honeylove.com slash TLL. After you purchase, they'll ask you where you heard about them. So please support our show and tell them we sent you. Shape your life with Honey Love. I think that story is so relatable. I can relate to it. I'm sure a lot of our listeners can relate to that because I know at least out of my friends, like everyone has this a level of family issues and family codependency and that feeling of like being torn when like maybe you want something different from your parents or there, there's like a family culture you feel like you have to stick to. So let's I mean, share a little bit more about that. Like what advice do you have for people who feel stuck or stifled, like you said, in their families? I would say start to get curious. It's my favorite word to really empower people to start using more. If you are stuck in patterns of people pleasing, of overfunctioning, of doing things out of a lot of obligation, of struggling with a lot of guilt get curious. What's coming up for me right now? Why? Why is this happening? What are my thoughts about this? What are some of these internalized beliefs that I have about who I'm supposed to be or how I'm supposed to be or whether or not I'm allowed to disappoint people or people are not like whether or not people are allowed to disagree with my choices or they always have to agree with them. Whose permission am I looking for? Do I need that permission? right? And just start to ask better questions of yourself. I think so many of the things that we are struggling with can be brought into the light and we can start to work through them when we ask ourselves better questions, right? Um, And then just start to really just look at like, what happened here? What happened that created or caused some of these beliefs? Because I know that it's not the norm for everyone. There are some people who set boundaries and feel really great and confident about them. There are some people who don't say yes to everything and people still really like them. There are some people who are comfortable and confident in their own skin, but they don't look like supermodels, you know, walking down the street. Like there are people who are breaking these rules that I have in my head about who you're supposed to be or how you're supposed to be or what you're supposed to do with your life. There are people who are breaking those rules and living these more full and free lives. And Why am I not letting myself do that? And so, you know, starting to just ask ourselves better questions. What am I afraid of? What feels threatened? What feels vulnerable? What's coming up for me around this? And like I was saying at the beginning, that we can learn so much more, like we have so much more wisdom within us that we can, you know, be that we can reveal for ourselves by just learning to get curious and ask ourselves some better questions. Yeah, definitely. Earlier you were saying how we have, like our brains have so much power to change our lives. And I think a lot of it is our, like changing our beliefs, right? So tell us more about like, what don't most people know about this process of like analyzing your thoughts or just what don't we know about our brains and how it works? Like what should we know? Right. Yeah. And we know this, right? That like our perspective informs so much of our lives, Mm -hmm. right? So if we understand that for the most part, our thoughts create our feelings and our feelings drive the majority of our behaviors and our behaviors create the outcomes or the results that we get, right? And so, you know, if you want to change your results, you have to change your thoughts. 
And this isn't like, you know, some magical, like magical kind of thinking sort of thing. But if we are going to bring it back to the fundamentals, right, my thoughts are going to create the majority of my feelings. My feelings are going to drive my choices and my choices are going to create my outcomes. So if I want something different, I have to do something different, which means I have to feel something different, which means I have to think something different. Mm -hmm. Right. And so if you're really looking at like, what are my, what, what is the outcome that I have that I don't like, that I don't want? And if I'm going to reverse engineer it, right, this is, this is what I keep doing to get this thing. Like, you know, and if I'm like, okay, why do I keep doing this? Well, I can look at because I'm feeling this way. Okay. Why am I feeling this way? Oh, because I'm having these thoughts. And so then if I want to change my outcomes, I have to really just look at which thought. It's not about thinking positive. It's not about thinking, you know, the proper thought. It's about which thoughts are going to be in my best interest. Mm. That's really helpful. What a great way to frame it. Because I think a lot of people, yeah, you can't just say positive thinking. Like it, it, yes, it works, but you have to understand like the the logic, right? Of how you got there. And they have to be thoughts that we believe, right? And I did a video on this and I got a little bit of backlash for it, where I was basically talking about how positive affirmations are a waste of time. Because standing in front of the mirror and being like, I'm amazing. I am wonderful. I can do anything. I am like super productive and focused all the time. If you, if there's not a stitch of truth in any of that, that your brain is willing to accept you may as well just stand in front of the mirror and be like, I am a dill pickle (laughs) because your brain is going to find as much ability to connect with that as any of these other things. So not to knock positive affirmations because in their essence, the, 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 the title is true. So it's an affirmation. We have to be affirming something that we already believe to a certain extent, Mm -hmm. right? And so if I am reaffirming something in my brain that I may have forgotten or I may not have been focusing on, or I may have let all these other fears or doubts override, then that's going to be a helpful thing to remind myself. So instead of these positive you know, affirmations, what are my healthy reminders? What do I need to remind myself of right now by maybe even looking back and taking an inventory over my life so far, things that I have accomplished, that I've succeeded at, challenges that I've overcome, stuff that I've gotten through. Oh yeah, I can do hard things. I can figure things out. I can make changes. I can be successful because I have the receipts. I have the evidence to prove it. And if I am getting myself into that state of mind, instead of, oh my gosh, this is so so hard, I can't do it, being like, you know what? I have felt this way before. And I have gotten up and I have worked at it and I have figured it out and I have done it before, which suggests to me that I can do it again. And it's okay that it feels hard or it's okay that it feels overwhelming or it's okay that it feels confusing. That's okay. Those feelings can exist. It's not about negating any feeling that we're having, um, but it's also saying those feelings can exist and I can still take action. I can still make changes. And that is going to be a lot easier if I'm also going back and changing some of those thoughts to be like, you know what? I can figure this out. I can do this. I am the person who gets up and doesn't let failure or mistakes or defeat or frustration keep them down. Yeah. Basically, you have to come from a place of honesty. Like you can't just jump to the positive affirmations. You have to have that level of I like it makes sense and I believe in this. Right? Yeah. I don't call it positive thinking. I call it responsible thinking. Mm. Right? Cuz sometimes we get into these states where we're like you know, let's say just something really simple, like a friend doesn't text you back and you're like, oh, they didn't text me back. You know, they don't care about me. They don't really like me. Come to think of it. Like I haven't heard from any of my friends for a couple days or, you know, I was with this person the other day and they didn't seem all that interested in the conversation. Oh, nobody likes me. Nobody likes me. I'm a loser or I'm a reject or I'm not good enough or there's something wrong with me. Like this is this very sort of elementary example, but it's so yeah. interesting how often these little things, right, will have a certain feeling, will have a certain experience. And then because our brains like to be efficient, 
right? Like our brains like to do things that are as easy as possible. So if I am having this thought or this feeling that like, whatever it is, I'm not good enough. I don't have what it takes. I'm not smart enough. I'm not capable enough. I'm too, you know, lazy, not lovable, whatever that is. You have this initial thought. And then because your brain likes to be efficient, it's going to immediately start to come up with every bit of evidence that it can to support the thesis statement, right? (laughs) So my thesis statement is, I'm not good enough. I don't have what it takes. I'm not lovable, whatever that is. And then your brain is like, oh yeah, it's true. Because look at this example from when you were like in fifth grade, or look at this example from when you were at that event, or look at this example from last week, right? And it's going to pull all of these pieces of quote unquote evidence to support that thesis statement because that's easy for your brain to do. Mm -hmm. It takes effort for you to look at this statement and question it and be like, okay, so in this moment, I had this setback, I had this failure, I had this mistake, or I had this friend not respond to me in the way that I wanted them to. And my brain is drawing these conclusions. You don't good enough. You don't have what it takes. You're not lovable. And it's going to actually take work for me to be like, okay, wait a second though. This is an isolated experience in this moment. And yes, I'm feeling frustrated or hurt or disappointed about this. However, this is this thought or this feeling in this moment is not a global truth. Because I have a lot of evidence to suggest the contrary. I have a lot of counterfactual evidence right now, because what I'm thinking right now isn't actually a fact, right? It's just a thought, knowing that thoughts are not always truths, feelings are not always facts. And being able to say, oh, like, I just was out with friends on this weekend, this last weekend, and we had a great time. Or I just gave this proposal to my boss last month and they were saying how great I was and how valuable I was to the team. Or I just, you know, went out with this person and they told me that they really liked my company, right? Like whatever that is, we're like, oh yeah, oh yeah. (laughs) But the reason why it's not so easy for us to do that is because it takes work and our brains are, you know, these primitive parts of our brains are trying to conserve energy to be able to, you know, engage in the fight or flight in case, you know, we're in actual danger, right? So if we kind of look back to our primitive brain, the primitive brain's job is to keep us alive and to reproduce. And so it's not going to spend all of this energy sitting and contemplating whether or not what I'm thinking or feeling right now is true. It's just going to be like, okay, this is what I'm thinking. This is true. You know, that's just it, right? Because it's easy. Mm-hmm. So if we can kind of look at these primitive, primitive parts of our brains as trying to like, you know, make things as easy as possible for itself, the conscious evolved part of our brain has to come in and be like, okay, wait a second. I'm going to do things differently now on a conscious level because that is what I have the ability and the capacity to do now because life is less just about these sort of basic survival and reproductive functions. Life is also now about loving and thriving and growing and experiencing and and experimenting and expressing. Yeah. Basically, it's a choice that you have to make to be more intentional about seeing yourself with using that positive evidence to support the positive aspects of yourself. Yeah. And isn't it interesting how we'll have like one failure or setback or frustration and then your brain is like, well, this happens all the time, right? Yeah. Yep. But then we'll have like one success or, you know, positive thing or do something really well. And we're like, oh, well, that was just a fluke. (laughs) You know, I was just talking to my girlfriends about how our earliest memories are usually like the traumas and the painful experiences versus like happy moments, right? You don't really remember that many, maybe if it's extremely happy, sure. But there's a lot of happy moments that we don't remember because I don't know why our brain just like doesn't give it importance, but we remember more of like, the the painful stuff that sticks out or the failures is that something that that you find in the way people think yeah and again eileen that's adaptive right like it actually it's our brain trying to protect us so you're not going to be protected by remembering the good stuff 
you're going to be protected by remembering the bad stuff. So we think back to like our ancestors, you're not going to be protected by only focusing on the berries that you Mm -hmm. ate and that, you know, nourished you and that made you feel great. You're only going to be protected by remembering the berries that someone ate and then dropped dead. Right? So you're <laughs> going to know, Just okay, survive. yeah, I'm not going to do that again. So the reason why our brains have this like natural negative bias, which they have found now in the research, which is the same reason why we often remember the painful or the difficult or the traumatic experiences is because our brain wants to keep those in the for- forefront to not repeat them again. Mm-hmm. Right? Because again, our brain is wanting to keep us safe. And you can thank your brain. You can be like, thank you, brain, so much for doing your job by trying to make me remember all of these terrible things (laughs) to try to keep me safe. But then overriding that again and being like, but I am safe. I am okay. I am resourceful. I am resilient. You don't have to protect me quite so much. And it's now safe for us to focus on the good things, the positive things, the love, the connection, the trust, the safety. It's okay for us to focus on that now. All right, let's take a break. Support for today's episode comes from One Skin. If you have sensitive skin, you know how hard it could be to find a product that doesn't cause irritation. But One Skin makes it easy. Their topical supplements are formulated with soothing ingredients and natural antioxidants. Plus, they're gentle enough to use every day, even if you have sensitive skin. One Skin products are powered by the revolutionary OS1 peptide, which is scientifically proven to target aged cells that cause lines, wrinkles, and thinning skin and reverse the biological age of skin by several years. I love using their face and eye cream knowing that I'm helping my skin become more resilient to aging. One Skin is the world's first skin longevity company. By focusing on the cellular aspects of aging, One Skin keeps your skin looking and acting younger for longer. Get started today with 15% off using the code TLL at oneskin.co. That's 15% off oneskin.co with the code TLL. After you purchase, they'll ask where you heard about them. So please support our show and tell them we sent you. So let's talk about self-esteem because I think that's such a foundation for... Yeah, living a great life. What would you say are like the keys to building like a healthy self-esteem? Man, <laughs> I know this can go deep. No, it is so simple. Oh, is it? It's one of my favorite. This uh, this thing came out of my mouth one day, and it, nothing has ever made more sense. Where the only thing that makes confident people special is that they know they don't have to be special before they can be confident. So, so many of us think that our sense of self, self self-esteem, self-confidence, feeling good about ourselves is a destination. Once I do this, once I look like this, once I achieve this, once I accomplish this, once I have this, I'm going to feel good about myself. I'm going to finally let myself feel good about myself because I have done the thing that I think is going to give that to me. But what if I could just feel good about myself now? As I am, who I am, how I am, flaws, mistakes, awkwardness, right? Like imperfections, all of it. What if confidence, feeling like a really strong sense of self was not a destination, but it was a decision? Mm Mm-hmm. And I just decide because, you know, even thinking about that again, there are people out there who are breaking our rules all the time, right? People tell themselves, well, well, like I have to look like this before I can be confident. But then there's people who don't look like that who are like, yeah, I feel great about myself. Or I have to have this certain body or this kind of hair or this kind of job or this level of success or this many friends or whatever sort of we are, we are trying to get to before we can feel good about ourselves. But then there's people without those things who feel good about themselves. Mm -hmm. And we're like, oh, what if the only (laughs) thing that's been preventing me from feeling good about myself is this thing right here, this like mass between my two ears. Mm. But the the big question for a lot of people is how do you do it, right? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And this is a beautiful, like this is more kind of recently been integrated in my work. 
And it's this concept um, of, it's called radical self-love, which includes radical self-acceptance. So what's radical about it is that I am not going to try to become anyone or anything else as a stipulation for my self-love and for my self-acceptance. And maybe some of us need to start with self-acceptance before we can move into the love part, but it's about radically accepting the good, the bad, the dark, the light, all of who we are. Now, it doesn't mean we have to love all the parts of us, but we can love this sort of whole intricate, interesting, complex being and accept that as a human, I come with all the parts. And if I actually want to work through some things that I feel like are causing, you know, holding me back, that are not allowing me to live my best life, then I'm going to work on those things. But I still accept that they are a part of me. Because we can't actually work through something if we're not willing to acknowledge that it exists in the first place. So what does radical self-love like look like, not look like, but what is it, what is it, what's happening in your brain? (laughs) Like when you're choosing to love yourself? Yeah. And I guess, I mean, it's called radical self-love, but it's not even that radical. Because if we think about children, and I don't know, like probably most people have a child in their life that they love, right? If it's your own child, if it's a niece, a nephew, a really close family friend, and that child acts like a jerk sometimes. Like, let's be honest, that child can be annoying. They can be kind of a jerk. They can be selfish. They can be difficult, right? They can be moody, but you're not like, ooh, I don't love you because you come with all these other parts. I don't love you because you act like a little terrorist sometimes. Mm -hmm. (laughs) right? We're like, yeah, I love you. I love you. What you're doing right now is kind of annoying and it's not my favorite, you know, way that you behave, but I love you. That doesn't change. I still think you're an incredible human being. And I think, still think that you are amazing. And I just am in awe of you. Why can't we do that for ourselves? It's the same idea where we have all these stipulations and all these parameters and all these hoops that we need to jump through before we're going to allow ourselves to be like, yeah, like you're an awesome human being. And I think that you're amazing. I didn't say, I think you're perfect and you can do no wrong because I'm, you know, that's not possible. But with all of it, I still think you are an amazing human being and I love you and I value you. And I see you and I know that you come with all of it and that's okay. Right? We're so easy to give that to other people, but we're so reluctant to give that to ourselves. Yeah. It's so hard because we're such perfectionists, right? Or, Or maybe you grew up with like conditional love where you learned you had to be a certain way in order to be loved or be lovable. And so it's, let's, let's talk about how to like undo some of those like conditioning, I guess, that you you might have been raised with to reach that radical self-love. Yeah. And then I guess the first question, yeah, I love the word that you use there, the conditions. So regardless of what conditions were placed on us or the, our interpretation or our beliefs around whatever conditions were placed on us as children, what are the conditions that I'm placing on myself? Because now as a grown-up, I know that I can't change other people's conditions what are my conditions? What have I taken in and taken on that were perhaps other people's conditions that I've now unconsciously adopted as my own? Right? We think about so many of these thoughts that we have about ourselves. I'm not good enough. I don't have what it takes. I need to be like this in order to be worthy. Right? And we just like kind of taking a step back and asking ourselves, and I talk about this in my book, about you know, here's your room, right? Your brain is this room. And how often do we stop and look around in the room and be like, oh, this is what the curtains look like. This is what the lamp looks like. These curtains are maybe a little paisley. It's a shag carpet, maybe a floral couch. But like, I didn't decorate this. (laughs) Someone else came in and decorated it. And actually, I'm not really down with this style. I really like this. I don't really like, but 
okay, so someone else came in and put this lamp there and they chose this carpet, but it's not how I want my space to be decorated. So how about I just either send those items back to their original owner, donate them to Goodwill. Some of them might need to go in the dumpster, but now I am going to bring in the pieces that I like, that fit with me, that work for me, that I'm comfortable with. And thinking about that with our own thoughts, so we get these thoughts that we have, like, I'm not good enough, or this is what I need to do to be loved, or if I'm like this, then it means that I'm not worthy, or whatever that is, whatever those thoughts are. Whose thoughts are they? And where did I pick them up? And how did I kind of unconsciously adopt them as, as my own? Right? I let someone come in. It's almost like I let someone come in and decorate my space, and it never occurred to me that I was allowed to get rid of those items and redecorate in a style that I like. So it's really choosing what do I want to think about me? What do I want to believe about me? How do I want to understand myself, others, life in the world? And bring those in and intentionally choose what I want. So instead of, you know, I'm a big advocate of instead of trying to stop something, our brains work a lot better when we start something, right? Instead of stop thinking those thoughts or stop having those beliefs, don't worry about so much about that. Instead, ask ask yourself, what do I want to think? What do I want to start? What do I want to be calling in? What do I want to be practicing? What do I want to be knowing and believing about myself? So it's that intentional choosing. Yep. I love it because I'm all about, like my, my content is about like intentionally designing your life and creating your dream life. And then this is the deeper level of intentionally designing your thoughts and your beliefs. And that's where everything starts is, do I even want to think like that? Do I even want to, you know, like how it's amazing how much you can design intentionally. Isn't it? Isn't it amazing? We don't, it doesn't even occur it's to crazy. us. There's so much work to do. Right? <laughs> There's so much excavation. You're saying at the beginning, what is like one thing that people don't know that you want them to know? And essentially it's, yeah. it's that. The power that you have to, to declutter your mind, to redesign everything. To it's choose, all, right? Yeah, to exactly. choose. What do everything I want to place. think about me? And what thoughts are really just not serving me mm-hmm. that I have unintentionally or maybe unconsciously continued to believe and abide by? Right. And I mean, it is deeper work and it's not something that happens in a moment, but it is something that we can start to get curious about. Mm -hmm. Right. And just really asking ourselves, is this thought serving me? Is this repeated action serving me? Is this the outcome that I want? And if I do not have the outcomes that I want, then let's reverse engineer it. Now, I'm not naive in thinking that like, you know, like everything in your life is your choice. Absolutely, that is not true in this kind of simplistic form. Sometimes we find ourselves in circumstances that it's just part of life, right? We're in a difficult circumstance, something going on that is not necessarily within our control. And that is true. And although we don't always have control over our circumstances, we always have choices within them. And it you know, brings me back to... The last line in my book was from Viktor Frankl, who was a concentration camp survivor. And not a direct quote, but basically he says, everything can be taken from a person except for his ability to choose his own mind and thereby his own way. That's beautiful. And really understanding that our internal world is not something that people can take from us unless we continue to let them. And it's not easy. We don't live on islands. We are impacted by other people. But it's really becoming more conscious of when someone gives something to me, right? So many of us are used to just accepting it. Someone has an opinion, someone has a thought, someone has a two cents to add, someone has their, you know, seemingly superior wisdom to impart on us. And we, so often we just sort of blindly accept it, especially those of us who have been socialized as women. 
we could go into the whole history around that. But, you know, like we have been socialized and a lot of us have the belief that we just have to accept what comes at us instead of being like, okay, they're sending me something and I can stand at the door and look at it and decide whether or not I want to receive it or put a little return to sender Mm -hmm. and give it right Right. back and be like, I'm going to leave that with you Mm -hmm. because that's not mine. And not only is it not mine, me receiving it is not going to be helpful to me. Mm -hmm. Not to say that any kind of, you know, feedback and be like, man, that's your opinion. I don't care what you think. Sometimes other people's opinions, other people's feedback are going to be helpful for our own um, development, for our own growth. And, you know, to like be able to sometimes see things that we might not be seeing, but we get to decide that we don't blindly have to accept everything, that we're allowed to contemplate and consider whether or not this is going to be helpful for me. And if it's not black ink, return to sender, here you go. (laughs) (laughs) It's so important to note that we have that power because I think naturally a lot of us just automatically intake everything and then we, other people's thoughts or opinions become our own and we don't even know where we stand. And I think the tough question, and. I'm I'm someone who suffers from this too. It's like you don't know what you want, where your where your choice ends and like someone else's opinion begins. You know? Yes. So how I guess what advice do you have for people who struggle with knowing where that boundary is and how to you know what I mean, find that sense of self. Yeah. And I think really just giving ourselves a little more space. In our modern culture, we don't have a lot of time for space. <laughs> you know, or one thing to the next, to the next, to the next. A lot of that can be um, an expression of anxiety that we fear sitting in silence because we don't really want to sit with our brains that aren't so nice to us when they have, you know, are, are left to their own devices, you know, or we just have this idea that being productive and always being effective and efficient is what I need to be doing as a human. And if I'm ever not doing that, then I'm wasting time, right? Or I feel guilty when I take just time and space to just exist in my humanity, but really giving ourselves just a little bit more space, a little bit more time for space and listening to those whispers. And so much wisdom comes when we stop trying to always do the right thing or feel the right thing or be the right person. Instead of just taking a little bit of time and space to be like, okay, where am I at right now? And if I just pay attention to listen, what makes the most sense for me right now? Not saying that it's all about what I necessarily want in this moment, because sometimes the things that we want in this moment aren't going to be the things that are in our best interest. But having a little bit of conversation with ourselves and being like, again, asking ourselves, what is the outcome that I want? And this is why it's so important for us as humans to be like, I don't know which direction to go if I don't have, you know, somewhere that I'm going towards, right? But if you have some like goals, if you have some things that are important to you, if you have some values that are helping direct your decisions, if you have some of that clarity, then it's going to make it a lot easier to listen to yourself and be like, okay, this is the outcome that I want. This is the goal that I have. This is what's important to me. This is what I'm working towards. What decisions are going to lead me towards that on my journey? Does that answer your question? Yeah, definitely. To to sit in your own space and to to ask those questions. As a, it's really creating your own bubble where you can think about these yeah. things deeply and feel it and feel the directions. Yeah. And also you're allowed to have sort of a, a, a direction that you're going and you're allowed to recalibrate and redirect on your way. You're allowed to have more different information or a different experience or a new idea and then recalibrate. But it is really important. Like if we want to know kind of which direction to go, then we have to be having some kind of goal or destination in mind. But if we're just sort of sitting there kind of flailing through life, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what's happening, right? 
then it's going to be really hard. We're going to, we're not going to be able to trust our own wisdom because we're like, I don't know what this wisdom is about. (laughs) And I mean, it doesn't mean that you have to have everything clearly figured out. And I remember I spent a lot of time in my twenties flailing. I just felt like I was flailing. I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. I didn't know what I wanted to do with my career, but I just was in this point where I'm like, I'm just going to keep showing up and I'm just going to keep trying things and trust that in this process, it's going to become more clear. Yeah. And it gets clearer along the way. Yeah. I, I, I can relate to that as well. And at least you learn what you don't want, right? You get, oh, because definitely. I'm like, I'm, I'm a trained <laughs> ESL <error>. teacher. <laughs> I am a trained pre and postnatal doula. That's I'm like, I have a minor in linguistics. That's amazing um, though. All these yeah. things that I was like, I just needed to experience. She has range. Yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Julia. So I want to talk about your book. It's called Drive Your Own Bus, How to Get Mentally Strong and Into the Driver's Seat of Your Life. Um, I, I love this topic uh, like mental strength and emotional toughness. So yes. how do you define what that is? What is mental strength? Mm-hmm. Great question. I'm also just starting a new YouTube series on this as well, how to become more mentally strong and really seeing that like mentally strong doesn't mean that nothing ever impacts us. It doesn't mean that we become, you know, numb to or devoid of emotion. I know for me, I'm a big feeler. I'm a highly sensitive person. I'm a deep feeler. And I love those things about me. It makes being human harder sometimes for sure, but I wouldn't give it up because I would never trade it because of the other side of it. I love the other side of it. But mental strength means that we, when we are impacted by something, when we are in the muck, we commit to continuing through it. That we commit to seeing it through. We commit to allowing ourselves to be humans who have a full range of human experiences. And so it comes a lot down to being able to process an emotion, being able to not neglect or turn our back on our, on ourselves when we're having an experience or an emotion or going through something, right? It comes back a lot to that like radical acceptance of like, this is what my humanness is going through right now. And it's not necessarily right or wrong or good or bad, right? It's just what's happening in this moment. And I'm going to be with myself through it. I'm going to see it through. I'm not going to spiral out I'm not going to sit here and then like massage it and like fondle it and indulge every little negative thought and every defeatist attitude. But I am going to just notice that what I'm feeling right now is hard. Right? And we think about when we're having like a difficult emotion, if we were to just able to keep it clean, right? So keep that emotion clean. I'm feeling sad, I'm feeling bad, I'm feeling mad. And what my client, one of my clients just said, the hardest feeling for me is feeling jealous. I hate feeling jealous. Right? But just acknowledging I'm feeling jealous, it's just part of being human. There's no such thing as a wrong emotion. Mm-hmm. There's just emotions. And just being able to acknowledge that to ourselves and just being like, you know, this is what I'm feeling. I'm feeling anxious, I'm feeling worried, I'm feeling scared. This is manageable. This is a feeling. This is a pretty manageable feeling. What becomes unmanageable is when we start to kind of make things messy. And these are called like secondary emotions, where we start to have thoughts about our emotions. Mm. So I shouldn't feel this way. What's wrong with me? I just need to get over it. I just need to be more positive. I just need to not let things bother me. I just need to not get so worked about stuff, up about stuff. Or then we do it external where we're like, that person needs to not be like that. If only people were like this, I wouldn't have to feel this way, right? And we kind of just like create all of this other stuff around it. And that's what we get stuck under. So mental strength comes so much from just being able to acknowledge whatever it is that we are thinking or feeling, accept that this is just part of the expression of my humanity in this moment, and then deciding what do I want to do with this now. And even just this like simple exercise of being able to acknowledge and accept that we are humans who have a whole range of different experiences and emotions, even that one simple thing does so much for allowing us to move through whatever it is that we're struggling with. Because often it's the resistance, it's the judgment, it's the criticism, 
right? It's the self-rejection that comes with whatever it is that we're going through or feeling that that's what we get stuck under. Yeah. I love that concept of just like keeping that emotion clean, being like keeping it in its like container and allowing yourself to feel it, but not attaching all these other other thoughts around your emotion where it gets messy. That's actually really game changing. I'm sure even that, that point alone can help a lot of people. Yeah. And it's amazing how often we don't let ourselves do that. We think that there's like this right way to be human. Even I had a client recently that was like, I sometimes feel like I have to win therapy. (laughs) Like I have to like, you know, like if I'm feeling something, I have to like justify it or, you know, wrap myself up in it and like, you know, tell myself that it's like, okay. And talk myself. And I'm just like, it's okay to just sometimes feel like things suck right now. And that's just it. Right. And we'll talk about it, but we don't always have to like tie it up in a bow. Right. Wow. Okay. So do you have like a favorite chapter or a favorite les- lesson that you shared in this book that you can share with us today? I really, really like the section on self-compassion. So self-compassion, it's this word, a kind of a term that gets tossed around a lot. And we don't really know what it means. But the work of Dr. Kristen Neff, who has basically like devoted her, a lot of her research and her career into pulling apart what it, what self-compassion means. And she's done some really, really beautiful work around it. And really just uh, one of the key elements of self-compassion is just learning to talk to yourself as you would a good friend, right? That friend that you know isn't perfect, but you love them, you think they're great, you believe in them, you know that they sometimes make mistakes or maybe make choices that aren't like the best for them, but it doesn't change how you feel about them. You're still always on their side and rooting for them. So if we could start taking on a little bit more of an attitude with that for ourselves, like what would that be like? If we're like, man, I, you know, that wasn't my most shining moment. I'm like, I just had a really hard day or I just yelled at my partner or I just, you know, uh, frittered away the whole day. I didn't get anything done. Or I just like got into this thought spiral of being like, Oh, I suck and I'm not good enough or whatever that is. What if we went to that friend and told them this thing, what would they say to us? They wouldn't be like, Oh yeah, you suck. Oh my (laughs) gosh. What's wrong with you? Oh my gosh. You're pathetic. They might be like, Oh, okay. What was going on there? What was happening? Right. Why, why did you like lose it? Why did you get so upset? Um, what was happening inside of you? Um, why did you kind of, you know, fritter away the day and let yourself get kind of taken away by these things that are not the best for you? Right? What was going on there? And just being able to like, just listen and get curious and being able to offer that reassurance to be like, you know what, you are human. And yeah, that probably wasn't your most shining moment, but um, you're a human being and you're allowed to not be perfect all the time. And there was probably some other things going on there that were driving some of that, right? Like, what would it be like if we talked to ourselves that way and got curious and understanding and compassionate with ourselves instead of immediately harsh, hard, and judgmental? Yeah, I feel we're just more supportive and understanding of ourselves. Understanding we don't have to be perfect all the time. Like, it's, it's normal to go through these ups and downs. It's not saying like, oh, you're terrible. It's saying, oh, not your most shining moment. What do you want to do differently next time? Right. But I still love you. You're still amazing, right? Yeah, Having that like yeah. positive. Yeah. Love it. Yeah. This isn't, this isn't like the, the epitome of who you are as a person, this, this decision or this moment or this outburst or this struggle. That's not, that's not the epitome of the de- definition of who you are. This was an experience that you had. Yeah. Self-compassion. Um, what is, I mean, we're getting close to the end. So if you were to share one final lesson for our listeners today, what is something that you think, mo- you know, everyone should absolutely know or learn about? I think we've covered a lot of it today. Um, but really just go a little easier on yourself. Being human is hard. And it doesn't come with a manual. And most of us, we're trying. I saw this meme recently on social media that said, do you know who's struggling right right now? 
literally everyone. <laughs> Just be kind. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. And be kind to ourselves. And not everybody is going through big struggles at every moment. We go through seasons. Everyone goes through ups and down, but downs, but no one rides for free. And life kind of comes with about a 50-50. You're not failing if things feel hard. Being human is hard. You're not failing if you don't always have it all together. Nobody does. And anyone that says they do is lying. <laughs> and some people are going through seasons in their life where they've got a little bit more together and things are kind of working, but like no one rides for free. And so just be gentler on yourself. Being human can be really hard. And you're allowed to experience the full range of emotions as a human. So often we're like, I only have to think positive and be positive and be happy and be grateful and be joyful all the time. And if I ever experience anything else, then something has gone wrong or I'm failing. But if you think about it, we don't become complete beings by only feeling half of our feelings. So this isn't about stopping ourselves from ever having any of the quote unquote negative feelings, but it's about changing our relationship with that. And if we could change our relationship with ourselves and with any experience or expression of our humanity, I think it would make the world a whole lot better place. And I say that this work that we're doing, it's not only life-changing work, but it's world-changing work. Because what would it be like if every human being was going through life with a bit more of a managed mind, with a bit more kindness towards themselves? with a lot less shame and a lot less kind of anger with themselves. And people were just going through with more love and acceptance for themselves, which then would naturally translate into more love and acceptance of others. How would that make the world a better place? Yeah. So doing this internal work, it's not just life-changing work, it's world-changing work. Mm -hmm. I'm so with you on that. It's like we are mirrors to the world, right? If we love and accept ourselves and we can love and accept others. And that's huge. Like that in itself is huge. Yeah. And people think like, oh, self-love is so selfish. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, but here's the thing. When you are really struggling with your sense of self, when you're feeling really bad about yourself, what are you thinking about most of the time? You're thinking about yourself. You're thinking about, oh, I shouldn't have said that. Oh, I shouldn't have done that. Oh, what's wrong with me? Why can't I be more like this? Why can't I look more like that? When am I going to be successful? Am I ever going to get to what I want? Am I ever going to be this person that I want? Like you're so focused on yourself, mm -hmm. right? But when you feel good about yourself, when you just feel comfortable in your own skin and confident in who you are, you're actually not even really thinking about yourself. Because like, why? You don't need to. You're like, mm -hmm. I'm good. <laughs> we're good we don't we're need good. to like be sitting around yeah. picking apart and scrutinizing and wondering and trying so hard right like we just are and so then we have you know not only do we just feel like better which we're allowed to just feel good just for the sake of being humans that feel good but we actually naturally have more love and acceptance to give to others it's like your own cup is full so you can give and spread love to others it is true yeah. You're just like this overflowing to others. Yes. What you said about when we feel bad about ourselves and criticize ourselves, like that's being selfish because all the ener energy is going within. It's, it's focusing on ourselves when we're not even focused on what's around us. Versus Absolutely. if we love ourselves, then we're, we're good and we can focus our love and energy outward if we want. Yeah. Loving yourself is one of the most selfless things that you can do. Oh, I love that. All right, Julia, thank you so much for sharing everything that we got we went through today. It was a lot. Um, where can we find you online? Yeah, so YouTube, I put up videos pretty much every week. Um, it's at Julia Christina Ma, I think it's under. <laughs> we'll find the link and we'll add it in the show notes. Or you could just Don't type worry. in Julia Christina and it'll come up. My videos are pretty much all black and white, so it's fairly easy to find. Mm -hmm. And then on um Instagram at Julia Counselor. Um, those are kind of the two main places. And then my website, juliachristina.com, Christina with a K. Amazing. And also, again, plugging your book, Drive Your Own Darn Bus by Julia Christina. Thank you so much. I loved our conversation. I think this will help a lot of people out there. And yeah, I really appreciate you coming on today. Anytime. Thanks so much for having me. 